Wow, what a crowd. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. General Hewley leaned over to me and he said, wow, look at this crowd. You better let them know that this isn't Congressman Schiff's presentation. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're here for the right thing, believe me. My name is Barry Graham. I'm chairman of the Marines Memorial Foundation. And tonight is sponsored by the association, which is a 501c19 nonprofit veterans organization. And we encourage all of you to support our uh, programs and services. One example is the Gold Star Parents event, which will be held this Thursday and Friday at the club. We encourage all of you to come and join us for that uh, celebration. If you'd like to support that program or programs like this, you can go on marineclub.org, click donate, and we appreciate your support. Tonight's program is sponsored by Colonel Jack Garcia, a retired Marine who's very close to the association. He's been a longtime supporter, a career Marine, a former board member, but even more important to him, his cousin, Lieutenant Al Garcia, was killed at Iwo Jima. So he contacted us and said, I'd enjoy being a sponsor of tonight's program. We appreciate what he's done, and if any of you are interested in sponsoring a program like this, please contact me or General Hewley. We have some very special veterans with us tonight. We have veterans of the Battle of Iwo Jima with us. I think there are three, and if you are one of those veterans, would you either stand or raise your hand so we can recognize you? That's incredible, thank you very much. Now it's uh, my privilege to introduce not only our guest speaker, but our relatively new president and CEO of the Marines Memorial Association. And for General Hewley, this is really a return to the Bay Area. Uh, General Hewley went to high school right down the street at Washington High School, to college across the Bay at Berkeley. Uh, his... <laughs> It, believe me, he reminds us all the time he went to Cal. <laughs> uh, his sister held her wedding reception here, and his dad, who was a career Marine, served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and his last duty station was here in San Francisco in charge of the recruiting station as a sergeant major, and Jan and his family lived up near the Presidio. So you can see this is really a welcome back for him. When Jan left Berkeley as an NROTC scholar, joined the Marine Corps, and during his 37 years, he served in virtually every command and staff position the Marine Corps has, eventually becoming Deputy Commandant of the Marine Corps for Plans and Policies, which is essentially the Chief Operating Officer of the Marine Corps. So last year, when the board got together and knew that we needed to replace General Myatt, who had chosen to retire, we wanted to find someone who was a strategic thinker, someone who is passionate about our mission, and disciplined about execution. And we found that in our new CEO, General Jan Hewley. Thank you for that kind introduction, Barry. How's my sound okay? I hope I can live up to that expectation there, but uh, I, I think a debt of gratitude goes to Barry and Julie Graham, how many years have you served on the board of here now, Barry, and carried a heavy load? Seven or eight, too many years. <laughs> too many years, so thank you. I'm honored that you would invite me. Uh, it it's, really does me great honor to be recognized by all of you, um, to be able to speak, and to be able to be such a large welcome back. So here we go, without further ado. Think about this. Back in 1945, you woke up to the Sunday paper, and there it was, the picture of the Iwo Jima flag being raised. You looked at the front page. It was a war-weary, who's got a cell phone? Oh, jeez, forgot to. I got to take this one. Hold on just a second. It's Washington. Yes, I can hold for the Commandant. 
Yes, General Neller. You checked out our new website today and you saw the presentation was, no, it didn't go yet, it's just starting now. Well, you're on the East Coast, there's a three hour difference. Yeah. Well, you, oh, we got a great turnout. Yes. Yes, sir. The Commandant says, thank all of you for coming. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I, I was here. Yeah, yeah. We do have copies of, extra copies of your picture. <laughs> 25 more copies for your mother. I got it. It'll be in the mail tomorrow. No, we already have a guest of honor for the next Marine Corps ball. It, the Secretary of the Navy is offered to come. So we're going to have the Secretary of the Navy here in November. So, yes, sir. I got it. I'll tell them. Thank you very much for the call. Next time, get your time zones correct. Thank you. That, that's just the way my involvement almost got started. General Neller and I had worked together at Headquarters Marine Corps. Um, he was a one star, I was a three star. He called me sir and I called him Bob. Now the <laughs> thing is different. So I was out playing golf. This all started, this adventure for me started in April of 2016. It was a nice, pleasant Sunday afternoon, Northern Virginia. I was playing golf and my phone rang. And like any lousy golfer, I ignored it. Yeah, it'll go to voicemail and I'll get it later. I forgot that phone call until about 8.30 at night, Sunday night, and I said, oh geez, voicemail, I better check to see who it was. It was the commandant had called and left a voicemail. He said, call me back right away, I got an issue I need to talk to you about. I said, geez, Sunday night, 8.30, should I call? So I called, and it rang about three or four times. I said, it can't be that important, he'll call me back tomorrow. So I hung up, and it's about 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and my phone rings again. So it was General Neller. And I said, well, sir, I called you back a little while ago. He said, yeah, I was busy. I was watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> so there, there, that got my start. He said, here's the deal. We think we've got an issue with a flag raising on Iwo Jima. And we think we've misidentified some people. So we're going to convene another board. There was one in 1947. And we think this one might be a little controversial. And you're bulletproof. So why don't you go ahead and take it? So I really didn't have much of a choice. So we put together a panel of 10 of us, and we convened what's now known as the Hewley Board. I didn't name it. That's the way they get named. And we looked at this. Now think about this. 73 years ago, you woke up Sunday morning. You knew there was a battle going on. It was raging. The nation was war weary. This is 1945, and it had been a long stretch for them. Casualties were mounting. Things were going on, and all of a sudden, that iconic photo comes across your front page of every major newspaper in the United States. It spawned a war loan drive. It spawned a stamp that was the best-selling stamp, the first stamp that ever depicted living members, and the best-selling stamp until the Elvis stamp came out. <laughs> Honest to goodness. It, People lined up around the blocks just to buy that stamp in 1945. It spawned a war memorial, and it steeled the hope of a nation. Let's talk about why those people didn't get properly identified and what we ended up doing about it. Next slide, please. So up until about three or four years ago, and I believe you had a Dustin Spence gave a little bit of a talk here at one time, the Marine Corps had recognized these individuals. Now everybody's probably very familiar with a recent movie about 10 or 15 years ago based on the book Flags of Our Fathers by James Bradley about his father being a corpsman raising that flag. Well these two amateur historians, um, a guy by the name of Eric Krell and Foley. Foley is a rubber duck salesman in Dublin, Ireland, okay, <laughs> believe it or not amateur historian, and he got operated on. So while he was recovering, he broke out the photograph of this, and he started doing some comparisons. He says, you know, something's not making sense here. So he contacted a couple of people at headquarters Marine Corps at the History Division, and they said, now nah, you're all wet. Get out of here. So 
He pursued it, and so did a couple of other people. Now, in Headquarters Marine Corps Defense, they've got a stack of affidavits this high of people that said they raised the flag on Iwo Jima. Uh, <laughs> guys that were probably way off on the right flank, but they were flag raisers. So, you know, there, there's been things. So this was what was normally thought of. That was previously Doc Bradley there. That's not Doc Bradley, they said. That's actually the guy behind him, Franklin Sousley, who moves up from that position to that position. Okay, so now, now we got a hole in there. Who was it? An unknown PFC up to this time by the name of Harold Schultz. How could we get it wrong for 73 years? Well, we're the Marines. We're the Marines, we're not perfect, we're the Marines. So let's talk about this a little bit. So further, photographic evidence kind of showed that, yep, these guys might have a case here. You know, by the way, they went to the History Channel and they also went to uh, uh, one of the other major magazines and a couple of news stations, and they said, we'd like to really kind of have your cooperation and put this together because we want to put out, make a, a big show out of this. So what I'm going to show you is that I'm going to use, instead of their names, in the future I'm going to use these positions. And I don't want you to memorize them right now. We'll come back to them. But we'll use those positions as I go through and make the case. Now, this was not the first case of misidentification. And I was not the first board. In 1947, a major general by the name of Pedro Del Valle was tasked to look at how we misidentified this individual down here, Corporal Block, and to set the record straight. And that's an interesting story of itself that I'll also include. So I've got about 35 slides I'm going to blow through here. And if I want to get you out of here on time, that means about one a minute. But if I straggle, too bad. What are you going to do? You can get up and leave. So. Next slide, please. First off, let me recognize Ann Walk. She is the one that put these slides together for me. And, and if you like it at the end, I want an extra special round of applause for Ann. So what did we find out? What were the finding, findings of fact? I didn't know it for about my first 25 or 30 years in the Marine Corps that there were actually two ra flag raisings, OK? The first flag raising went at about 10, 10 o'clock, 10.20 that morning. And I'll get some EWO vets who will say it happened and some will say it didn't, but that was a big event on the island. D-Day was four days earlier and the ships, a lot of them had moored. And when that flag was raised, that heartened the troops to look up and see that flag on the hill. Ships allegedly blew their horns. The Secretary of the Navy was aboard there with General Howland Mad Smith and he said, Howland, that flag flying up on that Mount Suribachi means there will be a Marine Corps for the next 500 years. Two years later, they convened, Harry Truman convened a board to do away with the Marine Corps. <laughs> okay? So we, we survived that. We do know that this individual right there is Doc Bradley. See his hand on a flagpole? He raised the first flag. We're going to show that. See this guy down here? That's PFC Harold Schultz. He's got his chin strap broken, and you're going to see some other indications on how we identified him. So we know Schultz was in the vicinity. They were both atop Mount Suribachi, and we know they both participated or were present at the first flag raising. And yes, Doc Bradley raised a flag. Later on that morning, the battalion commander said, you know, we need a bigger flag. And I think the Secretary of the Navy is going to try and steal that one anyway. So I want a higher, bigger flag sent up to the top of the hill. So he sends a squad from Echo Company 228 up the hill consisting of those members. Strank, Block, Hayes, Sousley, Gagnon, all members of the same outfit. That's when Rosenthal and a couple of other photographers, a motion picture photographer by the name of Staff Sergeant Genaust, were accompanying them up there. So they went up there with the new flag, and the instructions were, do not take that first flag down until the second flag goes up. We don't want the troops to look out and see all of a sudden no flag, because then they'll think the Japanese have taken the, the Suribachi again. So we want to make sure it's coordinated. So that was their mission, was to get that second up. So you see this picture here. Someone was clever enough to take that. I was actually Staff Sergeant Lowry from, that was there before. He got both flags coming and going simultaneously, an iconic photo. So about 1,300, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, some three or four hours later, they raised 
the second flag and drop the first one. So what do we know about that? Well, we learned an awful lot. I, a, a lot of us didn't even know that there was motion picture video that was taken of the flag raising. And we're going to show it to you. But there's some interesting things in this that I'm going to, going to show it a number of times throughout my presentation. But you're going to see, that's Sergeant Hansen, OK? He's the one that was originally identified as being at the base. You see, he's not at the base. He's standing off to the side. This is Sergeant Strength back here. If you look at his headgear, now we looked at stuff in infinite detail, but if you look at Sergeant Strength's headgear, he's wearing a soft cover. I maintain, and half of us maintained it was a soft cover on his head. And now you've got this individual walking in to the picture. This is Corporal Block sliding down. So I want you to pay attention to what happens into some of this. Now, if you look down here in this picture, as the flag's getting ready to go, you can just barely see the front of Strength's head. Now he's wearing a helmet. Wait a minute, how did he do that? He was up here in a soft cover and down there. They actually stood around for about five or 10 minutes with the flagpole while the other guys were getting ready to take the other one down. And then we think Sergeant Strength, somebody said, he probably said, oh gee, I better go get my helmet on because it's gonna be a picture maybe taken. So we think he ran out. So if he could have run out, maybe Doc Bradley could have run into that spot. So we wanted to prove beyond a reasonable doubt exactly who was every one of these individuals here. Now, Ganaust was standing next to Rosenthal as they were, getting, they were waiting for these guys to get ready, somebody to say on your mark, get set, go, up, down. And then Ganaust moves over, and you can see this picture is actually taken from a different location. And then he walks, he, he only had about 35 seconds worth of film left in his camera. So he started to take it, and they said, nope, not going yet, so he stopped. Then he moves, and then he's back again. And then it'll be interesting how they actually got, he, he and uh, Rosenthal both got there. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna show you this real good, and if Ann can do this really well, we're gonna walk through that motion picture. There is Strank, soft cover on. Here comes Schultz. There's Blocks starting to slide down into position. There's Sergeant Henry Hansen, a little bit more. Sliding, getting into position. Here comes Schultz, okay? Now Schultz is in the picture. Look at that weapon. It is at a funny angle because a rifle has a stacking swivel up top where you hook them together and you make them stand, and then it's got a sling swivel that is lower. This one doesn't have a sling swivel. He broke it. So he stacked his, his rifle sling up to the top. And you'll be able to see a number of times how it doesn't quite hang proper. So we've, we've pretty much identified him. Here's an individual in the picture now. Another one moved in to position. Here's the lieutenant getting ready to say, you guys ready? Are you ready? That's Lieutenant Schreier. Keep going, now wait a minute, we're not ready yet. Up, oh, now it goes up. Now if you look real closely, there's Sergeant Strank with his helmet on. I maintain it's a helmet. We argued about that for about two days. Did it really a helmet or not? So that's, that's where we were. So run it again. Here it comes. The flag goes up finally. You don't see Sergeant Strength, but there's, there's Schultz. OK. Now you're going to keep watching, and you're going to see others walk into the picture. OK. There they are jumping up, pushing it into the ground. There's the, now there's Schultz walking off. He's going to go gather some rocks. There's Sergeant Hansen. OK. He was down at the base towards, towards the bottom of the hill. He grabbed some rocks, and he went up there. See, he's stacking rocks at the bottom of it. He's the one that was originally identified as being the base guy. Now, you can see how six weeks later, somebody said, yeah, I remember Hanson was down there at the bottom. He must have been the base guy. That's how he got kind of identified, we think. So while that flag was getting ready to go up and Ganaust was standing there, he and, uh, he and Rosenthal were standing there shooting the bull, and Ganaust happened to be standing there, and all of a sudden, he saw it was getting ready to go. Joe Rosenthal turned around, held his camera up, and snapped it. Didn't even aim, because he was caught unaware. He came ashore that morning, and that camera, he had dropped in the surf. Yep. He had another one with him, but this is the one he, this was his favorite one. So he didn't even think that that picture came out. That's why he didn't even give it a second thought. Just turned and shot. 
Ganau says, did you get it? He says, yeah, but that's not going to come out. So afterwards, he posed this picture. This is called the gung-ho photo, okay? So let's get all the people up here on the hill. And there they are. You've got, there's Ira Hayes. There's some of the other flag raisers. There's Sergeant Strank right there. There's, there's about four of the originally identified flag raisers in there. And you say, well, they did take those names down. This was the platoon commander who had been hit, and he was aboard a ship when the flag was raised. He came up the hill about two days later. They carried him up because he wanted to get back in the fight. I don't know how good he was being carried up the hill. But he came up, and then some years later, when he's a major, he now went back and identified each one of these people that were in there. You've got Schultz's in this picture, and you can look these up later on. But there's about four or five of the flag raisers that we gleaned a lot of information off of, of this thing. This is called the gung-ho photo. Rosenstahl sent this photo back with the other ones in a whole thing. Comms wasn't, communications wasn't, wasn't in those days. And he sent it back, and his picture, the iconic photo, gets published. His editor calls me up and says, Joe, great picture. It's front page of every paper. Did you stage that photo? Rosenthal thought they were talking about that photo. He said, of course I staged it. Look, you know. That's how the rumor got started that the flag raising had actually been staged. Because Rosenthal and no, none of the people on the island knew for weeks that that photo had been the one they were talking about and was there. So when you hear people say, yeah, it was staged, yeah, that was staged, but not the flag raising. So what happened to some of these flag raisers? Okay, I mentioned Sergeant Strank back in Iran. You can see what happened right down the list. He died a week later. He got killed. Corporal Block, KIA the same day. The next day, the battalion commander gets killed in an artillery burst. He's, he's dead. Doc Bradley on the 12th of March, 1945, he gets hit and he's medevac. The people on the island didn't know where he was, but I know where he went. We'll cover that in a minute. And then PFC Sousley, three weeks, four weeks later, he's killed. So a number of the participants that were allegedly there, dead in a short period of time. Next slide, please. So what happens? By mid-March, that photo had been gaining such attention that a friend of Franklin Roosevelt said, hey, Franklin, you need to get those six flag raisers back here to the state and have them participate in the war loan drive that we've got coming up. It'll be a great hit. Everybody loves it. So he said, good idea. Sends a message to the commandant. Commandant sends it out. Send the six flag raisers back here. Franklin Roosevelt promptly dies a couple of days later. That's about when he passed away. So PFC, so they sent down to that battalion and they said, hey, remember that photo we took, that flag raising? Who raised that flag? I don't know. Come on, it was like being on a working party. These guys didn't pay any attention to it. So they, so they finally found out, oh, PFC Gagnon, the, the battalion runner down to that company, says, well, I was one of them. They said, well, he said, go get the other five guys. You've got to go back to Washington, D.C. and participate in the war loan drive. Well, this is great. So he goes and he looks around. KIA, 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 WIA, don't know where he is. And, oh, Ira Hayes is still here. He goes up to Hayes. Hey, Hayes, guess what? We're going to be heroes. We're going back to the States, and we get to participate in the war loan drive, and the president wants to meet us. Ira Hayes goes, we're getting ready to invade Japan. I'm not leaving. I'm not going back. I'm staying here with the outfit. I'm going to see this through. He says, if you tell anybody that I was one of those flag raisers, I'm going to kill you. And he was serious. He was serious. So Gagnon goes, I got my marching orders. So gets on the plane, and he goes back, OK, to participate. So when, when, when Gagnon, PFC Gagnon, arrives in Washington, he identifies these people. Again, we know Henry Hansen. Easy mistake. Saw him down there at the base stacking rocks. Must have been him. Remember, you're talking about an event that happened six weeks earlier. I can't remember who I sat next to at Christmas dinner table, you know, and they were my family. You know, how do you, how do you expect two PFCs who this, you know, really to get it right? So I, I actually congratulate them for doing the good job that they did. But when he got there to National Airport, Gagnon's met by a Lieutenant Colonel Public Affairs by the name of Hagenau. And he says, 
Where's everybody else? He says, ah, oh, they're KIA. Well, who were they? Starts giving them names, and he gives up these five names. So the colonel goes, there's six people in a photo. Who's the sixth one? He says, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you're a pretty salty PFC if you survived Iwo Jima, and some of these guys will tell you. I'm not going to tell you. For three days, he would not give up the name. And then finally, they threatened him with a court martial and throwing him in the brig. And he said, all right, it's an American Indian. He's a killer. And he says, I'll, he'll kill me if I tell you, but it's Ira Hayes. <laughs> Message goes out, send Ira Hayes back under guard. Don't allow him to talk to anybody. So Hayes gets there. Next, next slide, please. Hayes arrives, and he says, OK. Hagenau says, who are the six people? He identifies the same ones that Gagnon did to include Doc Bradley. So both of them said Bradley was a flag, that flag raiser. And he says, no, it's Corporal Block, not Sergeant Hansen. And Gagnon, so says the Lieutenant Colonel Hagenau says, OK, so then where's Corporal Block? Well, he's KIA. Well, where's Sergeant Hansen? He's KIA. So the Colonel goes, what difference does it make? They're, you know, they're both dead, so we'll just leave it as it is. Okay, that was mistake number one, because that stuck in Ira Hayes's craw. And he didn't let that go. He let it go for this. He eventually got bounced off the tour because he drank too much and he had too good of a time and went back to his, his outfit. But years later, he brought it up. He went and saw Corporal Block's mother, and he said, you know, that's your son in the picture. And she said, of course I know that's my son. Don't you think I know what my baby's butt looks like? <laughs> That's my son. I knew it all along. She says, you don't forget that. You don't forget that if you're a mother. So finally, he re they re Hayes made a big enough issue out of it that General Vandegrift convened the Del Valle board, and they set the record straight on that one. Next slide, please. So how did we actually go through? And what we did was we, we wanted to make sure if Bradley could have been mistaken, there were two people that said he was there. Now, Bradley, we got hit in medevac, so nobody had approached him yet, okay? And so how did we go about trying to determine who was there, okay? Uh, let me just recant just a second. So when Bradley got hit, he was in the hospital, medevac here, to Oak Knoll. They went up to him at some time later on in March, and they said, hey, Doc Bradley, did you raise a flag on Iwo Jima? He goes, yeah. And they said, have you ever seen this picture? He goes, no. Well, this is the picture of you. They showed him the iconic photo. This is the picture of you raising the flag on Iwo Jima. He goes, great. Did you know this was a sensation? No, I've been in the hospital. You know, nobody told me. Well, now you're going back to Washington to participate in this. OK, I raised a flag. Two people said I'm in that picture. I remember a picture being taken. I remember raising a flag. Never gave it another thought, OK? So what did we do? We actually went through each place and we said, if two people said he was there, maybe he wasn't in that spot, maybe he was elsewhere. Let's make sure we've got this right, and if there was a previous one. So what we did was Rosenthal, after he took the iconic shot, took his other camera, moved around, and as they're stacking rocks, he took this picture. That's got position number one, and that's going to be Corporal Block's position. And we need to get this guy squared away, because that's where the, the one was. Next slide, please. So what we did is we followed that film where those individuals walked to after the flag was raised and where they were pulling it up, and we traced them. So if you, you can actually get some more good photos of this, but that's Corporal Block, that's his boot camp picture, and you can tell that that's the same individual from the frontals we had. So number one, he was identified, number 1947 verified, we verified him as well. So then we said, well, the next one, this was Bradley's old position. That's the most controversial one. We, know, we pretty much know that Gagnon, I'm not going to take time with Gagnon. He was, that's Gagnon back there in position number two. Number three is, is the former Bradley position. Now it's somebody else. How did we chase that guy down? Next slide, please. Here's that picture. That's that same individual that was in that position. OK. If you look at him, he's wearing a cartridge belt, OK? He's got a pair of pliers on his hip, okay, you can see those. He's got that empty canteen pouch, all right? He lost his can uh, canteen someplace. Marine Corps, I'm sure, made him pay for it. They made me pay for every piece of equipment I wear. He's, he's not carrying a rifle, 
and he's not wearing a field jacket. His trousers, we looked at that, are not cuffed, okay? And we even went to the part of looking at the camouflage pattern on helmets and comparing them. That's the, the detail we got into. So when we went to it, we looked at that. So looked at that. Now, PFC Sousley in this picture is wearing all those same things. If you go back to that other picture, there's all the other stuff that I just mentioned. And now there's Sousley. Why do we think that's Sousley? Next slide. Because it's eight Bradley. This photo was taken. There's Rosenthal. This was taken right after the flag was raised. Okay. There's Doc Bradley. He's wearing his unit threes. Okay. Look at his trousers are cuffed and he's wearing leggings. He doesn't have a soft cover under his hat like Sousley does. This is Doc Bradley's gear when he raised the first flag. He's got a K-bar. He's got all this other stuff. Doesn't even look like that gear. How could we have made that mistake? I don't know. I wasn't born then. Next slide. Further, we went back and we got Sousley's boot camp picture. There he is. That's the guy. So we're pretty sure we got Doc Bradley out of that position. Next slide. So then we went, OK. We know that that's Hayes, got it. We're gonna come back to this guy. So now we gotta to go to Sergeant Strank, the guy that's hidden in the back. Well, if he left, and then all of a sudden we think there's a guy with a helmet on, could Doc Bradley sat there? What I think really might have occurred was when they were getting ready to raise the flag, Bradley was probably standing off to the side. And then they said, hey, let's get somebody else on this pole. And I think this is just totally mine. They looked over and they saw Bradley, but the PFC walked in instead. Now the PFC, Schultz, we'll talk about why they didn't necessarily know. So let's go back now and see how are we gonna make sure Sergeant Strank didn't really turn into Doc Bradley somewhere along the line. Let's look one more time. There, coming up, got it. Raise it all the way up. Okay, there comes Schultz. And up, ready, get set, go. Raise the flag. You never really get a good shot. Maybe you can see a little bit of a helmet, maybe not, of Sergeant Strank. So we argued, how are we going to do this? We got tired of arguing about it, and I went home that night. Okay, But a couple of the real conscientious people stayed, and they said, we got to figure this out. And what they did was they noticed that there is Sergeant Strank's left hand on the flagpole. It's the only way that that could be there. So they said, Look at his hand, and I don't know if it shows up clearly enough in this. There's no rings on that hand. That's Strank's left hand. Go to the next slide. If you look at the picture of Doc Bradley up close, he's wearing a ring on his left hand. There's Sergeant Strank in the gung-ho photo. No ring. People said it's Sergeant Strank. No rings. We have every reason to believe that was Sergeant Strank in that position. So we eliminated that. Next slide. I thought that was very clever of them. I was going to take credit for it. but <laughs> So now, how about this guy, Schultz? Here's the first flag raising with Schultz. See that strap hanging down? See his weapon slung in the wrong place? That guy had a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> he probably had to pay for that uh, sling swivel, too. Broke it, and some Japanese guy shot it. So we, we, we noticed him right up front, and that's what the other guys noted. So. Next slide, please. There he is walking around. There he is walking, trying to keep that weapon that just doesn't hang right. He's, he's got that there. And there he is walking over to gather some rocks after he left that position to help hold that thing up, the, the flagpole up. Next slide. So at the end of it, we made the recommendation of the Commandant that these are the positions and this is where they are. Corporal Block, Gagnon, that's, that's, that's Franklin Sousley, uh, Sergeant Strank back there, Ira Hayes. Ira Hayes didn't even recognize himself in this photo. He's, they said, well, yeah, there's a poncho back there. He said, I never put a poncho back there. But they said, aha, but you did have that Indian blanket that you used to tuck back there. He goes, OK, that's me. So he finally recognized himself in there. And then PFC Schultz. Let's talk a little bit more about this. Next slide. So everybody says, well, Doc Bradley, didn't he know? You know, couldn't he? Doc Bradley was a very quiet individual. He lands on the 19th on D-Day. On the 20th, his foxhole mate gets captured, tortured, and mutilated. 
pretty significant emotional event because Bradley found him, okay? The next day, Bradley is in thick of combat and commits a heroic act sufficient enough to get him awarded the Navy Cross. You land, your foxhole mate, you get the Navy Cross. You, 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 you commit an act. Pretty significant things. You get dragged up on the top of a hill, you participate in a flag raising, you get hit yourself, there you are in a hospital, somebody says you raised a flag, yeah, no big deal. But he did, had written a letter home saying, you, I did participate the day after that in a flag raising, you may hear something about that. We've got good evidence. What do we think about Bradley? Was he trying to hide? Bradley never identified himself there because he could not remember which position he was in. And things just didn't seem right to him, but he never identified himself and he, he, he always kept quiet about it. He didn't even tell his family he had received the Navy Cross until his son discovered it. I don't even know what his mental state was when that movie came out and the books were written, but we think he just confused the events, emotions, things like that. We don't think there was any trickery. We don't think he tried to any deceit. We just think he was conflated about the whole thing. And that's the way we left the record. Next slide. How about PFC Schultz? What happened to him? Why didn't he ever say anything? PFC Schultz got hit himself a few days later, got, got medevac back to the States, and medically discharged in July of 1945. Went to Los Angeles, got a job with the Postal Department, where he worked for the rest of his life. He got married when he was like 59 or 60 years old. He had two stepdaughters. Never mentioned to anybody that he had raised a flag. As a matter of fact, we don't even know if he remembers raising a flag. Because when he passed away some years ago, the only things they found in his desk were his Purple Heart, his discharge papers, his DD-214, and a copy of the gung-ho photo with his name on it that he had written. That's it. Never mentioned it. So when we chased him down and went to his family and said, he's a flag raiser, it was someone who he had married some 60 years later, and she had two stepdaughters. So that's the story of Schultz. Why he never mentioned it? Quiet, unassuming man? I don't know. We don't know. So there he is, PFC Schultz. Next slide, please. So because no good deed in the Marine Corps gets undone, told you the Commandant said this would take about a day and a half to do. I automatically doubled that, and I said this is going to take three days. It took us 10 days to do the flat first flag raising. And then we went and briefed the commandant, and we said, you need to set the record straight probably on the first flag raising as well. So he said, good, have at it. So we went back into session, and what did we find out? Well, up to that point, these individuals, there's Sergeant Hanson, paratrooper boots, you know, soft cover. There's his helmet laying off to the side. This was the first flag raising, and this is who they identified as being flag raisers. Don't have to memorize them now. So what did we do? We went back and we did the same thing in reverse order with them. Next slide. What really happened that morning, down before the first flag was raised, the battalion commander sent a patrol up consisting of these four individuals. Okay, two NCOs in there. He said, you guys go up to the top of Mount Suribachi and see what's up there. Ooh, good idea, Colonel. <laughs> Off the four of them trudge. They go up the hill. Sneak over the rim. They're down in the, in the uh, base. It's eerily quiet. The wind's blowing, but they hear Japanese voices. It's good enough for us. We're out of here. So they turn around and they haul freight back down the hill, sometimes sliding on their fannies, getting down the hill, just to get down. So they get back down to the rear. They were in Fox Company, not Echo Company. They report to their company commander, Yep, there's stuff up there, have at it. The two NCOs say, we're hungry. They walked over to the sh one of the ships that was docked to go get sandwiches, leaving the two PFCs by themselves. That's good, that was fine. Good initiative by the NCOs, okay? So what happens next? Next slide. The battalion commander gets a little bit concerned and he says, they actually, these guys going up on the next patrol, taking the first flag up, actually saw the other guys from a distance coming back down and waved to them. No intel, not, 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 no much, not much help. So he says, Lieutenant Schreier, you take a, a patrol up the hill, 
take this flag. This is one they had taken from a ship off of Pearl Harbor. This was the first flag, a small one. We want it put up there. They didn't know what they were going to do. So as a patrol of probably some 20 or 30 people, we're not exactly sure. We've got a lot of the numbers went up. They said, boy, if we don't make it, we at least want some memory that we did this. So they passed that flag up the line as they were going up on the patrol. OK? There they are. That's part of the patrol right there. We think it had up to 38 people in there. And then they got up there, and just good Marine Corps luck, guess what they found? A pole to put a flag on. It was poles that were, I mean, look at that terrain up there. There's nothing up there except the pole that they needed. And they went and they put a bullet hole in it in the right spot so that they could tie the flag to it. These pipes were left over from the Japanese cistern. They had used to collect water up there, just luckily enough. And of course, the next guys found one as well. So there they are, tying the flag on. Now they're getting, we're going to eventually move it up to that position and raise it up there, but they were smart enough to get down there. What happened in the meantime while they're doing this? You know, you'd think Japanese voices. Sure enough, out from one of the caves while they're doing, they're, they're setting up their original security, hits himself in the head with a grenade, throws it, boom. The photographer rolls down the hill, breaks the camera himself. Another Japanese officer comes out and attacks Sergeant Boots Thompson while he's there, who pulls out his trusty 45, which immediately jammed. And he goes, oh my goodness, here's this guy getting ready to hack him with his samurai sword. And one of the other people shot that guy. So while they were out there doing this, I mean, these guys are under attack. You know, there's, there's the, those slides and everything. There's all those caves and stuff there. So that, that's what's going on. But they look like a rather jovial group when you see, you know, pictures being taken here. So there's some of them tying it on. There's who we think, you know, as they're getting ready to go. Next slide. Here they are now getting ready to raise the flag. Okay, you can see the ships down below. That's the north part of the island. They're getting ready. There's, there's Corporal Lindbergh. He's kicking a hole in the ground with his foot. They're going to turn this base around, and they're going to shove it into that hole, and they're going to raise the flag. So as they're getting ready to do it, Sergeant Lowry, the photographer, goes, uh, wait a minute. I'm out of film. <laughs> Don't raise it yet. I want to take a picture. And they go, we're not a bunch of Hollywood Marines. You'll take a picture some other time. So they raise the flag without having a picture taken. So then by the time he gets his camera loaded, next slide, the flag's up. So he takes this picture. Now, again, people are having been claimed to be a flag raiser. What defined a flag raiser? Well, we think everybody that fought on Iwo Jima pretty much had something to do with raising those flags. But OK, if you want to split it down, we said who actually picked up the pole and put it up. Here's Corporal Jacobs. He was a radio operator. He was talking to the bottom of the hill. Can we lower it now? Yep, up, yep, up, send up more batteries. Got it. With Schultz, there's PFC Schultz standing off to the side, providing security. We narrowed it down to just those that we think actually raised it up there just for the record. So this is who we came up with, where these were the original flag raisers. And then these people, we don't think, raised the flag. Next slide. And the reason we don't think they raised the flag was some of them were close, some of them were getting ready to put it in, and we made the deduction that that's who raised the flag. Next slide, please. So we rectified the record to show those names there that, that were there. Next, now, now, PFC Mitchells was claimed to have been, was, was recognized as being a flag raiser. Clearly, he didn't raise the flag. He was providing security for, I guess, Sergeant Hansen's helmet. I don't know. But so, <laughs> so there he is. Here's Schultz. He didn't raise the flag. So we just identified it as those folks that actually had their hands on the flagpole when the first picture afterwards was taken, and those that had it on beforehand. We think that that, that was kind of a continuity. Next slide, please. So PFC Charlo, member of the Flathead Indian tribe in Wyoming. His congressman, Charlo gets subsequently killed on the island as well. But his congressman went back and said, PFC Charlo is a hero. He raised the flag on Iwo Jima. OK, put him on. Congressman said so. Wasn't, wasn't within 30, 12,000 miles of it, but OK. Mitchell obviously didn't raise it. So we took both of those individuals out. This is a picture of PFC Charlo was on that initial fire team that went up the hill, and they came back down. He should have gone and got a sandwich. He wouldn't have had to walk up the hill again with everybody else. 
So he got, uh, subsequent patrols went up. This patrol went up after the first flag was raised, but before the second flag was raised for more security and more supplies. There's Charlo coming into position right there. Didn't raise the flag. Next slide, please. Mitchell's didn't raise the flag. There's Charlo again, same thing. So we took him and Mitchell out of being flag raisers. Next slide, please. Okay, Mitchell, we said we took him out. We left Sergeant Hansen's helmet in. Next slide. What else happened in the meantime? Other patrols came up. This, the chaplain got up there before the second flag was raised, and he held mass. That's Doc Bradley attending mass. He even mentioned that he attended mass. So while the chaplain is holding mass, the second flag raisers are up here on a ridge line carrying a pipe, talking like Marines do. And somebody said, Shh, come on, a little reverence here. We got, you know, stop swearing and cursing. We got mass going on. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so they walked over there. But, but that occurred. So many people after a while started sneaking up the hill that they had to put a checkpoint down at the bottom and keep other patrols from coming up. Now this, was, this, was, this occurred before the, they brought the second flag up. Next slide, please. So that's who raised the flag. That's who we gave credit to. And you can see it getting ready to go up. We think we got that one right as well. And by the way, there's Doc Bradley raising a flag. Next slide. So bottom line, those are the flag raisers. We think, like I said, you all raised the flag that participated in that battle. We think we've got the record straight. There will still be controversy, I suspect. But that's who we came up with. That's that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. How, how, how was that, General Neller? Thank you, General Hewley. The Marine Corps always gets it right. Sometimes it takes 70 or 80 years to get it right, but we, we do get it right. We might not always be right, but we're never wrong. Exactly. <laughs> Has anyone challenged the findings of your study since it's come out? Strangely enough, I got a member of our former member of the board who said, who called me this week and said, I see you're getting ready to uh, have a uh, presentation on this. And uh, I said, yes, sir. I was a general I used to work for. He says, you're not saying that that's really Gagnon, are you? Said, yes, sir, we are. He says, there's evidence to show that it's not. <laughs> Bring it on. I don't, I'm done. I've got a job here now, so they get... They can have the Smith board for all I care. They can have the Graham board. Do you know what uh, Joe Rosenthal thought of the controversy, the original controversy, and did he participate in any of the studies or uh, conversation around it? Once Joe Rosenthal finally found out which one they were talking about and realized it, he said, no, no, he attempted to set the record straight. But, you know, what's that old adage, you know, a rumor flies around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. And... So the word had gotten out, and yes, he for many years had to defend that he did not stage that photograph on the left of this thing. What about the original uh, civilians who brought up the, the controversy at the first? Have you circled back with them, the yes. guy in the hospital? Good question. What about those civilians? Um, we did a symposium on this last year this time at headquarters Marine, or, or down at Quantico. And we had both of them come in, and they believe that we've got it right um, as well. So yes, and they were very grateful. You can actually go on the History Channel, and they put on an entire show on this, as well as I think it was National Geographic magazine also did one. So yes, they're, they're, in, they're, they're at peace now on this. And there were a few other people that had, had made this allegation that they had talked with from the 5th Marine Division before who have since passed away. And you mentioned a couple of the folks who lived. Uh, what happened to the others? Do you know the flag raisers, the ones involved in that when um, they came back? Let's see. There would have been Ira Hayes, okay? And we all know the story of Ira Hayes. He got sent back from the war loan drive because he, the man was an alcoholic. He couldn't handle his liquor. Uh, he eventually got discharged from the Marine Corps, uh, went back to his Pima reservation in, uh, in, in Arizona, and ended up uh, climbing out of a bottle way too often. Uh, one night he passed out in a couple of inches of water and, and drowned. So he died probably, uh, I think it was the early 50s, he passed away. 
And then there was PFC Rene Gagnon, who went back to, I think, Massachusetts, where he was from, or New Hampshire. And he lived for a good long life, and uh, he passed away. But he did many speaking engagements and things associated with it. So, and Doc Bradley, we know, he lived in Appleton, Wisconsin, went back home. He was a funeral director. Um, never told his family he had received the Navy, Navy Cross. I don't even think he told him he was a flag raiser until his son was looking through his, his stuff and found the, the Navy Cross medal itself and then started questioning him. And he said, yeah, that's what I did. And that's what inspired his son to write the book and the movie. Now, we do know that, that both Hayes and Bradley participated in the movie, The Sands of Iwo Jima, which, you know, we, everybody's seen that 10 or 15 times with John Wayne. If you haven't, you probably ought to get your citizenship papers checked. <laughs> and, and so they participated in that as well. Uh, where, do you know where the flag is in the pole? Yes, I do. Um, it is at the Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia now, where they rescued it for a long time. Had the, the archives in the historical division for the Marine Corps were at the Navy Yard, which is right down the street from the Marine Barracks at 8th and I. They did not have a good facility, and it was stored in a cardboard box with a leaky roof dripping on it. So they, they, they saved it. It is now enshrined, and they have <clears throat> wonderful docents that will tell you the whole story, and it, the flag is on display proudly there now. About three years, huh? General Herney uh, said, hey, we want to dedicate a plaque back at the museum to Joe Rosenthal. And they said, he said, we're coming back. We're going to bring the Combat Correspondence Association from, from the, there that, that's the Joe Rosenthal chapter. And we've got this beautiful plaque. And we're going to have a Northern California general dedicate it. I said, well, that's great, sir. I look forward to seeing you back here. He says, no, not me. You're going to do it. So. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, Joe, so I, I was honored to be able to come down with my son-in-law and daughter, if you'll remember, and my wife. We dedicated that plaque to Joe Rosenthal. Now, it even goes back a little bit further in my memory, because when I was a little kid, my dad was stationed at Quantico, Virginia. And right outside the main gate, for those of you who've been to Quantico, there's a Iwo Jima statue. And that's one of my very first memories in life. And the next thing I got to do was when I was a one star, I got to honor a parade. I had a, you always got, had to have a parade for somebody. My individual was Felix de Weldon, who did the Iwo Jima War Memorial. So I, you know, I, I kind of had a history of doing this. And then when General Herney told me what I was going to do, him having three stars and me, or he had four, I had three, he won. But I got a nice, great bottle of wine in the honor of dedicating. For those of you who uh, want to read the story in, uh Leatherneck, when uh, General Hewley's, uh, the, the Hewley panel, uh, finished their findings, it was published in Leatherneck. Very nice article. This is actually, it's an old issue, August of 2016, but you can go on leatherneck.com and uh, get the issue. It's got pictures in it, the story of uh, General Hewley, and uh, very well done. And with that, uh, General Hewley will be around after this presentation to answer any of the further questions. We got some additional questions, but I think you can all see why we're so uh, grateful and thrilled to have uh, General Hewley and his wife Patty come back to San Francisco and join us. And Ann Thank Walker you. for doing the slides. Thank you, Ann Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.